uh, Dr. Joseph Kachichian um, with us. He's, uh, he's part of the Middle East Institute family. He writes for us. He uh, uh, often speaks here when he writes his books. He reviews books for our journal. And uh, although he lives too far away in California, uh, we consider him very much part of the Middle East Institute family. Uh, and we're glad that he's chosen this venue to launch in Washington uh, his new book um, on, a, on the queen who's been extraordinarily influential in Saudi Arabia, a queen to Saudi Arabia's King Faisal. Um, he's going to speak this evening, give you a little teaser about his book. Copies will be on sale afterwards for a reduced rate of $30, since he'll hang around and be able to uh, follow up on the questions that maybe you didn't get to ask uh, during the question and answer period. He'll speak for about 30 minutes and then open up to our, our questions. Um, but, but before I sit down and let Joe take over the podium, let me just encourage you all to sign up you, uh, for the Middle East Institute's 69th Annual Conference, which will be held uh, Friday the 13th. Um, at the uh, Capitol Hilton. It's free of charge. The conference is free of charge. Uh, if you'd like to um, uh, join the luncheon at the conference, that your ticket will help support the Middle East Institute, uh, promote program, put on programs such as the one this evening. Uh, and I really encourage you to come to our banquet the night before where we, we will be honoring um, two extraordinary people, uh, the princess from uh, Sarja uh, for her contribution to arts, Hork Nor Kasimi, and um, uh, El Arian, Mohammed El Arian, um, who is uh, actually designing a lot of the economic reforms in Egypt now. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Joseph Katechian. Uh, you can all read his biographical note uh, in the flyer before you, but uh, he comes with a wealth of experience in Saudi Arabia. He's been working at this for decades. He's a member and scholar of the um, uh, Middle East Institute. He is a columnist. He's an expert. He's a consultant. He was an was a honorary consultant to Oman in uh, Los Angeles. He's a research fellow, and he's uh, our friend. So please... Joe, thank you. It's your podium. Thank you. Thank you. thank you all for being here. I'm truly happy to see so many of you and appreciate your presence. It's not every day that one sees folks assembled to hear about an Arabian queen, one who hailed from a country that is often in the news for allegedly creating tensions and adding fuel to various fires. Um, what will follow is a bit scholarly, but I'll try to keep it light, uh, about a leading personality who passed away in 2000, but whose legacy is alive and well. Before I start, however, I just want to take a few minutes to tell you why I wrote this book and how difficult the process was. As you know by now, this is my 11th book on the Gulf uh, region and the fifth on Saudi Arabia. And like all of its predecessors, it took the better part of nearly three years to research, compose, and publish. When you spend several years on a subject, you cannot but develop understanding unless you set out to smash it. Yet setting out to write about a woman who lived in a segregated society was even more challenging than I assumed. And truth be told, I did not embark on a crusade to either laud or denigrate Afet al Thunayan. I was simply curious to discover the person who left her mark on King Faisal, a subject that fascinated me ever since I was a little boy when I saw the king at the old open-air terminal building in Beirut, Lebanon, and about whom I composed a political biography in 2008. In other words, I discovered Iffat through Faisal and knew that she must have been a remarkable individual. I was simply a curious person, yet as a man, I did not realize when I set out on the project how challenging it would be. Although the Queen's female offspring were worthy legatees who welcomed my systematic, even quite intrusive questions, others were not as forthcoming. 
Uh, and since I needed to interview many women that worked at the institutions Queen Arfet created, in other words, complete strangers to me, there were a few hurdles to cross. Those of you who know how difficult it is to navigate in that kind of an environment will appreciate the efforts that went into it. Those who do not know will hopefully discover some of its more charming consequences in the book. Suffice it to say that a small team was necessary to identify potential interviewees, make arrangements to secure appointments, persuade them that a male American researchers would be asking questions even if several received me wearing a full niqab, cover face, travel to their destinations, exchange traditional greetings in what is still a highly conventional society when women do not mingle with strangers, especially males, and gather original materials about a person adored by most of the folks who knew her. My interviews with several elderly women who knew Afat al-Thunayan very well and who could tell me many stories about her, and they did, was something I will never forget and that I tried to share in this book. Of course, I was impressed, though my chief hurdle was to be careful and eschew a hydrography. Because I did not know the queen and never met her, I could only see her photographs, read a few letters she composed, and heard her voice over a family session mischievously recorded by one of her grandchildren. Over the course of multiple interviews with 53 individuals, itself a formidable challenge, it became rather clear that many were truly envious of the late queen's abilities to function, even shine, in Saudi society. As the book will soon be published in Arabic, March 2016, Riyadh al-Rayas, Beirut, many Saudi women and hopefully many Saudi men will discover their queen. That knowledge to me is a great recompense as the conservative society is struggling with reforms that truth be told is likely, are likely to change it permanently. Now, uh, I'm gonna skip over some of the material because I'm gonna only spend about uh, 20 minutes to, to discuss uh, the book itself uh, and the charming parts, of course, I'm gonna leave for you to discover yourselves. There is no point in telling you the juicy parts in the book, <laughs> otherwise you would not read it. But there is a chapter in the book that is titled A Pillar of the Al Saud. My contention is the following, that this woman was responsible for bringing the family together more than any other individual. Does it mean that she performed all this by herself? I do not want to take anything away from the other women of the ruling family that have also played pivotal roles in uh, family reunions, etc. But she was, in my, in my view, the person that actually saved the Al Saud from themselves. She was the one, that there are ser several examples, she was the one that would pay attention to family interactions, to avoid disputes amongst brothers, senior members of the family, to the point where Again, I'm skipping a lot here, to the point where after her, her husband, King Faisal, was assassinated in 1975, when she left the country for several years, went to her Paris residence and lived there for a few years before she returned. Upon her return, as it is the habit, most of the ruling family members, senior level, uh, go to the palace to pay their respects to the queen. When she returned, it was King Fahad, who was the ruler at that time. The king went to her house to welcome her, not the other way around. This was the esteem, it was a, in, in, in a highlighting of the esteem to which she was held uh, because all of the senior members of the family were guests at her table and, and would partake in the discussions that would take, take place and she would participate very much in these discussions. So therefore, I think that this is the woman that, that really brought the family together. That is my favorite part of the book, The Pillar of the Al Saud. I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to save the interesting parts of the first encounter between Faisal and, uh, and Ifat, of course. There are rumors that in fact Faisal discovered Ifat when he was on a trip to, uh, to Istanbul, in those days Constantinople. Istanbul became, it took its name in 1930. Before then it was known as Constantinople. Uh, but this is not the case. Robert Lacey in his book The Kingdom says that uh, 
King Faisal was a womanizer who was uh, on a prowl all the time looking for uh, young ladies and so on. This is again figment of British imagination and we all know how that can be. Uh, but suffice it to say that Faisal and Iffat met in Mecca in 1932 after she had actually written a letter saying their family situation was quite desperate uh, at the end of World War I and that they needed to come back home. Uh, Ifat, uh, Ifat's grandfather, Abdullah bin Abdullah, don't be surprised by the fact that father and son have the same name. It just so happened that Abdullah bin Abdullah was born the night his father passed away. So they gave the kid the father's name. And it's an anomaly because the Ottomans mistook him mistook Abdullah bin Abdullah for Abdullah, the father, arrested him, put him in shackles, took him to Constantinople, where he was a hostage for many years. Uh, the son was born there, that is, Affet's father was born there, Muhammad uh, Saud, who became a physician in the Ottoman army, died in World War II, probably in what is today Iraq. I tried to find the records of the military records, but I couldn't access the uh, Ottoman archives still classified or forbidden or destroyed, nobody knows. Uh, so therefore, uh, Ifet also was born in Istanbul. And when the father did not return from the battlefield, Ifet's mother, Asia, remarried. Remarried an Albanian neighbor whose name was Adham. Therefore, Ifet has a half-brother and half-sister from the second marriage. And eventually, the other family members were, came to Saudi Arabia as well. And Kamal Adham, Ifat's half-brother, became the chief, the first chief of intelligence of Saudi Arabia, was raised in the family, uh, and was Faisal's right-hand man. The reunion took place when the ship arrived into Jeddah port to go to pilgrimage. Ifat was not alone. She was 16 years old at this time. She was accompanied by her aunt. At first, only she and her aunt arrived. The aunt was handicapped in a wheelchair. So therefore, this is an important part of the story because Ifat grew up taking care of a handicapped individual in the family and was very much conscious and aware of the need for those members of society who needed that kind of assistance which will mark her for the rest of her life because Jawharan al-Thunayyan was always sitting next to her at the majlis. She would always be wheeled in and shown the deferred respect that she obviously earned in the family. Later on, when Ifat creates all the charitable institutions and health organizations, there is no doubt in my mind that the impact of her aunt's legacy on her pushed her to make sure that in Saudi Arabia today, being handicapped is no longer a taboo subject. On the opposite, handicapped individuals are taken care of and looked after. And again, this is Jawharan's doing. So therefore, the two of them arrive. And who meets them at the harbor? But the viceroy of the Hijaz, who happens to be Faisal. The impression, of course, is when they arrive, they will settle in. Eventually, Ifat will be presented to the king, the founder of the kingdom, Abdul Aziz, probably marry the king and end up in one of the palaces someplace between Jeddah and Riyadh. What happens is the opposite. Faisal falls in love with her. She is a superbly attractive woman, even at 16. And within two weeks or three weeks, the marriage is uh, completed. And Faisal sends a telegraph to Abdul Aziz saying, congratulate me, I married my, my, our cousin, Ifat Al-Tunayan, we're coming to see you soon. Uh, and of course, the father said, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, there, is, there is a lot more to the story. I am saving a lot of the juicy stuff for you to enjoy when you read the book. But I want to I wanna concentrate on two aspects before I stop uh, of the doings of the queen. And some of you may have this in your mind. Obviously, uh, the impact that she had on the role of women in the kingdom. And, and we always, I mean, obviously, this is a segregated society. And Arafat was a practicing Muslim. Uh, she paid attention to, uh, to all of the requirements 
that, that was there to, to be paid attention to, and she never contravened any of the rules, but she refused to wear a veil. She's one of the few Saudi women who did not cover herself. When she would step out of the house, she would put a shawl over her hair, and the moment she was in private again, the shawl will come off. She did not believe that this was a religious requirement, and in fact, this is something which was very dear to her heart. She never accepted the restrictions that were imposed on Saudi, in Saudi Arabia on women. On the other hand, she did not do what women have done in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Damascus, in Syria, and elsewhere around the turn of the century, where they actually removed their hijabs and joined the bandwagon of modernization. Uh, I discussed this in some detail in the book, where it happened in Cairo. And Cairo was a very important station for Ifat al-Thunayyan because there was a lot of going back and forth between the two of them. She used to subscribe to all the women's magazines that were published in Cairo at that time, so she knew what was going on, politically savvy. And even though during the first few years of her life she had nine children that survived, uh, four uh, women and, and five uh, men, four girls and, four, uh, and five boys, nevertheless, she was very much active in the family. She would, she would uh, during World War II, for example, she was one of the first persons that ordered that maps be brought from Egypt, from Europe, from elsewhere, and they will put them around the majlis so that they could follow on the news what the developments of the war were, because she knew. Uh, and, and upon her death in 2000, one of the papers that were discovered was a teacher's certificate, even though she never mentioned this to anyone throughout her lifetime. She was actually trained to become a teacher. And when she arrived in the kingdom, in other words, she was already rather formed as an individual, knew exactly what she wanted to do. So the two points, the, the, the first point is that she accepted the rules of the country, but also insisted that modernization was something inevitable and that she would embark on it. The second, her entire life was devoted to education. Now, Education, obviously we all talk about education, we all talk about the, the need to create institutions and so on and so forth, but in those days, the only kind of education that was available in Saudi Arabia was the religious kind. Uh, you would, the, the boys would be sent to a local cleric, they would memorize uh, the Holy Quran, uh, and, and they will recite it, and that was considered to be the level of education. And of course, if somebody was uh, capable, it will, he will advance a little more uh, in the learning process. There was hardly any, edu any education for girls. She created Dar al Hanan, the first school for girls in Saudi Arabia. And at the beginning, it was a flop. It failed because no self respecting family would allow their daughters to be actually sent to such a school where there will be foreigners, even if they happen to be women. Egyptians, Syrians, Lebanese, Palestinian, the teachers were all from those countries at the beginning. But she never gave up. She insisted that she would continue time and again and recreated Dar al Hanan the following year and the year after that, put her five daughters into the school itself so that the rest of the family, uh, the rest of the elites of Mecca and Medina at that time, Mecca and Jeddah, excuse me, at that time, would actually emulate them and would want to be like them as well. Now, of course, because when she arrived, Ifad did not know a word of Arabic and Faisal did not speak Turkish. Communication was tough between the two of them. Eventually, she learned Arabic and he learned some Turkish. The first four children spoke fluent Turkish as well, but her nickname was al Turkiya, the Turkish one, because she spoke with a very heavy accent. Nevertheless, she never allowed that handicap, that linguistic handicap, to prevent her from accomplishing the great things that she accomplished. Eventually, after Dar al Hanan, and after several other charitable institutions that were created, where Indigenous women, without any education, were actually taught how to read and write, basic hygiene, how to look after kids, to make sure that these kinds of facilities were introduced to them. 
She even went so far as to create a university which carries her name at that university in Jeddah today. In the book, in one of the appendices, there are two letter, excuse me, there are two letters um, in Arabic, which I discuss uh, in some detail in English for those of you who don't read Arabic, but it's remarkable to read her letters to the king, at that time King Fahad, and the heir apparent King Abdullah, how she asked for permission to set up these institutions. The way she discussed the matter with her brother-in-laws, who were obviously her ruler and, and the heir apparent, so she had to be differential. But if you read between the line these letters very carefully, and they're quite elaborate letters, in which she specifically asks for certain privileges, not financial support, mind you, she was asking for the right to educate women in a way that was not acceptable in Saudi society at that time. And Effet University, as some of you know, does not only teach the arts and the humanities and the regular subjects that we assume that women only study, but Effet University excels in uh, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, computer sciences, and all the other scientific uh, subjects that are being taught right now. This is her doing as well. Now, I'm running out of time. Finally, I want to say one more thing, and then I will stop and let you ask me as many questions as possible. Um, somebody was asking me outside during the uh, uh, break that we had earlier on about the fact that um, Ifat, as a practice in Muslim, was quite differential to the religious establishment, to the clerical establishment. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what to make of this uh, aspect, even though I wrote elaborately in the book. But um, she actually, I believe she actually strove for gender equality in the kingdom within the limits of Saudi society. She actually believed deep in her heart that with perseverance, it was possible to persuade the clerical establishment to welcome women's education, women's health care, and a variety of other things, some of which has been hijacked by the more extremist clerical establishment then as now. There is no denying this. We have to own up to the reality that is out there. Although she set out the precedent that in fact there could be challenges to the system. And the best evidence for this is the fact that now in Saudi Arabia, women are allowed to actually go to law school and graduate. Now, they haven't yet been permitted to actually appear in front of a Sharia court. As you know, all the courts in Saudi Arabia are Islamic courts, Sharia courts. Female lawyers still don't have a right to appear in front of a judge to plead their case on behalf of their clients, so far. Yet, the hurdle has already been crossed, and the inevitability is coming. What the lawyers, what these attorneys can do now is actually advise their clients in an antechamber. In other words, their foot is already in the building. The next step is to actually get into the courtroom, and that's coming sooner than people assume. This is her doing, in my view. This is the kind of precedent that she set out to force the system to change itself. She did not want to destroy the system. In my view, she was not a revolutionary woman. She was an evolutionary woman. She wanted the change to occur from within the system. And in that respect, she succeeded. And I will close by just uh, saying, uh, reading this, this part only. In my view, Queen Affet attempted to create, by created a solid modernizing environment for Saudi women so that they could articulate ideas to society, add value to their communities, and enjoy fruits of life as best as possible. She also worked hard to share her own perspective, which hovered around loyalty to crown and country at a time when Saudi nationalism was not clearly defined. We're talking 1930s, 1940s, early 1950s. In short, she worked to empower those who wished to be stronger pushed for an institutionalization process to the hilt, and shaped mentalities that were either reticent to move or too timid to act. As such, she was a true modernizer. 
who did not fit the classic theory of someone who copied from others, but one who adapted to circumstances as necessary, for she instinctively understood that society needed, in a sense, a homogeneous culture in which people were inducted to be able to do business with each other. When I wrote that sentence, I didn't even believe what I was writing, <laughs> to be honest with you. This approach did not mean that the search for such modernity was necessarily the search for secularism, or that it needed to dislodge the very idea that Islam and modernity were incompatible. In fact, her entire life proved that the search for material and spiritual progress were compatible, as she legitimized women-only public spaces by using an Islamic discourse. This did not mean that she accepted a second-class status. On the contrary, she viewed segregation as necessary in the conservative public milieu, but rejected restrictions on ikhtilat in private. Ikhtilat is the mixing, which is for forbidden in Sharia law, where men and women don't mix. The queen's objective, therefore, was to add value whenever possible so that Saudi women could benefit from what was offered them. And in that respect, I think she succeeded. I will stop here and let you ask me any questions you may have. And the rest, you will discover the book for yourselves. Uh, Queen Ifad had uh, five sons that survived, uh, and I discuss in the book she had several miscarriages as well. In those days, healthcare was uh, fairly bad. Uh, the eldest son, uh, Abdul Rahman, if I'm not mistaken, who passed away just a year and a half ago, uh, was a commander of a tank battalion in the Saudi army. Uh, then there is Saudi Faisal, the foreign minister, the longest serving foreign minister in the history of the kingdom, probably the world, more than 40 years. Uh, then there is uh, uh, Bandar bin uh, Bandar al Faisal, who was an Air Force pilot who flew F 15s during the war, a distinguished, decorated soldier. Uh, then there is uh, Saad, uh, who is a businessman, Saad al Faisal. And finally, Prince Turki al Faisal, who for many years was chief of intelligence before he became ambassador to the court of St. James in London and then here in the United States. He is now, my boss of course, at the King Faisal Center. Uh, he runs the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. But he's also uh, quite a uh, prolific writer in Saudi newspapers. Uh, and those of you who follow his writings uh, will appreciate the human touch as well. Every time he, he has one of these columns about family members, it's very moving. Uh, I, I, since I'm mentioning the men, I should also mention the women because they are, they are probably more important than the men in this respect. The eldest daughter, the first child, uh, was Sarah, Princess Sarah al-Faisal, who was the only one, she's married to one of the kings, uh, one of the sons of King Saud. Uh, she's the only one without child. She never had any children. And, uh, she spoke fluent Turkish and uh, a distinguished lady by any measure uh, that you can think of. She's now a member of the Consultative Council, Majlis al-Shura, one of two of 30 women in the Majlis who was a royal. There are only two royals in the family. The other lady uh, is a daughter of King Khalid, uh, 28 civilians, two royals, and she's, Sarah is, uh, Princess Sarah is a, a distinguished uh, person, very active, even today. Uh, then there is Princess Lulwa, uh, before Lulwa, there is Princess Latifa, who's married to a business uh, uh, man. Um, Princess Lulwa, who is the chairman of Ifet, chairwoman of the Ifet University and Dar al-Hanan, and she runs essentially her mother's institutional legacy. And finally, there is uh, Princess Haifa uh, Al-Faisal, who was married, who still is married to uh, uh, Prince uh, Sultan, uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, the former ambassador here in Washington, D.C. So uh, four very distinguished women who have marked their times as well. Yes? Uh, 
uh, that's an excellent question, uh, King. Where did you fit in that circle and That's an excellent question. Uh, before marrying Affet uh, in 1932, uh, King Faisal had 14 relationships. From the 14, there was only one child, Abdullah, the eldest member, one, one boy. Uh, again, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, but you have to understand that these marriages, these relationships, were tribally driven at a time when the kingdom did not exist as a state and that there was the tribal expansion underway whereby Abdul Aziz would essentially conquer several sections of the country as his Ikhwan movement rose and, and expanded from the stronghold of Najd. So therefore, at the end of each of these battles, there were, there were marriages that were consummated in order for the tribes to come together and commit loyalty to the victor al-Saud. Ifat comes in, therefore. She is uh, number 14 in that list. There is one other marriage that occurs afterwards. Again, an imposed marriage on Faisal, uh, from which there are ch three children, including Khalid al-Faisal, who is the governor of Mecca now, and formerly minister of education, very powerful man, and, and two uh, princesses. But uh, although there was this other marriage, uh, the Faisal Aifat duopoly was unique. I will give you a hint. I want you to read the book, so I'm not going to spill all the beans. I will give you a hint at how Faisal perceived Aifat al Thunayyan. Now, we're talking about royalty here. So there is court decorum who walks first, who goes first, who comes first, who sits next to whom, who stands up when somebody walks in, who remains seated, etc. Faisal always, always let Aifat walk ahead of him. This was unheard of. She would, she would hold mixed dinners at home where men and women sat together at the dinner table to share a meal. And Faisal really, not only he was smitten by her in terms of unadulterated love, but he really respected her because he knew that this woman came to the kingdom, even though a cousin, even though from the al Thunayan branch of the family, and I have a section in the book about the al Thunayans because nobody talks about them, even today in Saudi Arabia. A few years ago, they finally put uh, Abdullah bin Abdullah on a street name, uh, al Thunayan. Uh, but nobody talks about this branch of the family. Even though she's family, she was different from all the other princesses, from all the other women of the family. And, I, and Faisal knew this. And he, he appreciated the fact that he was probably married to the most educated member of the family. And he always, always paid attention to her view. She did not speak a lot. She was a good listener. She did not vent. Huh? She was a good judge of character. She would listen, pay attention. And of course, I'm sure, like most wives do to their husbands in private, uh, discuss important things that she observed, which she benefited from. Yes? Um, were there any issues that she focused on later in her life as she became more secure um, or after the death of her husband or any um, issues on which she either shifted focus uh, to focus on them more or shifted her own position on them? Well, I, I mean, th that's also a, a very perceptive question because obviously as a member of the ruling family when she was a princess, and later on when she became the queen, the only princess who has been given the label queen in the history of Saudi Arabia, nobody else has been given this title, uh, she would obviously have access to the family finances. Uh, the court allocated a certain sum of money as her privy purse from which she could dispense. But she was smart enough to realize that this was not gonna last forever. And that were something to happen to her husband, 
that you would need a source of income independent of the family. Now, I don't know whether you guys realize how this financial set setup works. One of these days, I'm going to write a book about this. Not now. It's too early. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, you have to understand that uh, in order to be a member of the ruling family, you have to do certain things to earn this kind of income. The more you do, the more income you have. And depending on your position, you have set salaries, if you would like, that you get. Okay? It's never enough. You can ask for more. Uh, but there is a system in place. So money is not, is not there. You have to ask for it. I thought was smart. She realized that she needed, for all the projects that she was running, including the charitable organizations that she wanted to run, that she needed a lot of cash. Hmm? So what did she do? She invested. She bought buildings. She bought hotels in her name. Huh? And there was a source of income from these facilities. In Jeddah, there is this famous tower called Binayat uh, al-Malika, the, the, the Malika's Tower, essentially, which is an income-generating facility that brings in oodles of cash every year. Right? She was a very generous spender. So therefore, she needed this money in order to pay for all the things that she was doing without having to ask either the king or anyone else when he was alive or afterwards when he passed away. So therefore, we're talking about a woman who had a lawyer, who paid attention to what was going on, who knew that she needed to stand on her own two feet, and she was very aware of the needs of society, read the paper, read the paper every day to make sure to knew, who, she knew who was doing what in that, in that society, in that city, who was getting married, who passed away, who had children. All of these things will be published in newspapers and instruct her attorney to go ahead and send appropriate gifts or, or uh, endowments or whatever it is that she was doing so that she actually had a presence in society. No wonder everybody liked her. I have, I have really was, uh, I have not found anyone to say something negative. And I've asked so many intrusive questions to find out whether somebody really was irritated by this woman. I couldn't find one. And I looked for three years, an irritated person. I couldn't find one. Uh, so this goes to her credit. I suppose that she knew how to manage herself rather well. And when her husband passed away, uh, her brother-in-laws, the future kings and the heir apparents continued to see her, continued to call on her, continued to seek her advice, and she was very generous with her advice. And when, for example, I'll give you an example which is very uh, telling. King Khaled dismissed one of the full brothers of King Abdul Aziz, the founder, who happened to be a member of the cabinet. He dismissed him. Uh, I don't know the circumstances under which this occurred, but there was a cabinet change, and this member of the royal family was dismissed. Effat picks up the phone and talks to King Khaled and says, you should never have done this. Your brother Faisal would not have done it. They cannot afford to be against each other. If this family does not stand together, it will collapse. You, of all people, should know better. No one else dared speak like that to a sitting king. She was the only one who had the guts and the courage to actually put the family interests ahead of everyone else. That's why she was respected. That's a very good question. She went back to Turkey on an official visit when King Faisal went one time. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, apparently the visit did not go very well. I, couldn't, I talk about this in the book. And when she came back, she swore that nobody ever would open Turkey's subject again in her presence. She would never again talk about her, never went back after 1964. Never. I don't know what happened. I tried to find out. But she was apparently very disappointed. Uh, I think I'm surmising now, because I don't have any evidence for this. Uh, I'm surmising that she did not care for the military dictatorship, since in the 1960s, Turkey was run by the military dictators. So she didn't care for that very much. But afterwards, when she came, she gave specific instructions that she would not want the subject to be brought to her attention ever again, and never went back. 
And incidentally, uh, in the book I discuss her background as well. There is some Cherkess blood in the family too. Uh, so uh, presumably she would have some, some sympathy. Uh, but again, this is surmising on my part. I have no evidence for this. I do know that three of their sister-in-laws, uh, three of their sister, three of her, sorry, three of her father-in-law's wives, not sister-in-laws, the founder of Saudi Arabia had three Armenian wives. Uh, of whom the children are known today. Uh, one of them passed away, but uh, Prince Nawaf, Prince Sattam uh, are, are, uh, are the children of Armenian wives. So therefore she knew about uh, what was going on in Turkey at that time. Is that the reason why they don't talk about the subject? I have no way of knowing this, but I'm just surmising that I'm sure the subject came up. Yes. Mother, uh, mother, who is Armenian, of they they lived next to each other. They used to visit each other a lot, and their grandkids went to her schools. So, no, I mean, I mean, I know about the yeah. part that they were very close and used to see each other and all that, but I don't have any evidence yeah. that exactly. these kinds of discussions took exactly. place. Uh, most of this book is based on the interviews that I conducted. Fifty-three individuals, approximately two hundred fifty hours of conversations, uh, that mostly have been tape recorded or. Uh, scribbled by me in my black notebook. I carry black notebook everywhere I go when I do these interviews, and and I hold that dear because the, all the secrets are in those black books. Uh, I did not I did not write everything that I heard. Obviously, uh, some things. I, I don't mean to be sinister about this. There are a couple of things that I know about her which I did not put in the book, not because it's embarrassing or not because writing about them would have made any difference, but because I actually came to respect her opinion about these issues as well. And this was her preference, then I would go along with that as well. She did not want to talk about certain topics, but obviously she told her family members, she told her friends about it. The attorney's wife, attorney, her attorney is an Egyptian uh, fellow. Uh, the attorney's wife has a lot of interesting stories which cannot be published, <laughs> but that's a different story. Yeah. yeah. I have to give you some more wine after this. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about how she influenced? It's known that her kids were more humble, modest compared to others, and how I don't know if in your book you talk about how she raised them as a mother rather than only her influence as on the society, like her motherhood side. Absolutely, I discuss each one of the nine separately. And her style was uh, very, very rigid. I mean, this is a woman that, uh, that imposed discipline in the family. Uh, Prince uh, Bandar al-Faisal, the uh, Air Force pilot eventually, who is an incredibly sophisticated man, well-read, um, he told me this, this story, which is in the book. Um, when he was going to uh, flight school and he had to learn how to fly airplanes and so on and so forth, one day they were sitting around the table and he asked both his father and mother, what was expected of me? What, what do you guys expect of me when I graduate? And she did not wait for King Faisal to answer. She answered. And she said, you graduate first and then we'll talk. <laughs> now that's, that's the kind of discipline you know, don't, don't uh, pretend that just because you're the king's son that automatically you have a birth in, in a position here or there. You are going to earn the position that you would like to have one day. And eventually he became a base commander uh, and, and uh, a Tabuk Air Base, uh, as the case was. So therefore she was very much disciplined. And of course the boys were sent to Princeton uh, at the prep school first, and then at the university. Saudi Faisal is a graduate from Princeton University. Um, he has a bachelor's in economics from there, uh, Prince Turki from Georgetown. But uh, the girls were sent to Montreux in Switzerland, and they're all graduated from Switzerland. Uh, the only one that did not go to Switzerland is Haifa, the youngest one, 
because she was born in Paris, the only one born outside of Saudi Arabia. She was born in Paris and went to French schools. That's why she speaks perfect French. Yes. On behalf of all Saudis and Saudi women especially, um, thank you so much um, for really celebrating Akbar Tathaniyan and recognizing the legacy she left on the kingdom. Um, in your book, you talk about her perseverance, how she worked hard to really earn the respect that she did, and um, the importance of her strong relationship with King Faisal. Mm -hmm. um, so as Saudi continues to undergo many social changes, and you mentioned women gaining seats in Majlis al-Shura, um, King Abdullah scholarship program um, as another example, what advice do you think she would give to, to the husbands, the fathers, the sons of our generation? Uh, th that's an excellent question uh, too. I think that you know she wanted to have gender equality in the country and she wanted Saudi men to actually own up to their responsibilities more than anything else. And I was actually motivated by this idea to write about her because I want Saudi men to read this book more than Saudi women. My primary audience are Saudi men. My hope is that they will really get to know Queen Ifat and really understand what it means to be a Saudi woman. This is a segregated society, unfortunately. It still is to a, to a large extent. There is this problem with ikhtilat, as you know far better than I do. But this is, she would have argued, a temporary phenomenon. This will change. She would insist that it will change, but gradually. She does not, I mean, somebody asked me a couple of days ago in, um, uh, at Texas A&M, I think it was, College Station, somebody asked me whether she was a feminist. She was not a feminist in the classic sense that we in the United States think of her. She did not burn her bra. That was not the kind of feminism that she espoused. What she wanted, she wanted young Saudi women to become so educated that their counterparts, the male counterparts, would actually feel pride in them. And they will not be satisfied with the ikhtilat restrictions that exist in Saudi society. Naturally, the process itself, she believed, would grow to such a way that people would behave in a much more uh, normal way. And the proof for this is that not only she did not wear a veil, none of her daughters wear a veil either. Even Princess Sara today, I'm sure you've seen pictures of her, in the newspapers at the Majlis al-Shura, she puts a shawl on her head, but her face is uncovered. There are other members of the Majlis al-Shura who have their faces covered, uh, but she doesn't do that because that's what they saw from their, from their mom. Uh, the, their mother wanted them to, and, and successive generations of Saudi uh, women, to actually assume responsibility, not be afraid of change. That excuse me, that gradual change will come slowly but surely and that this change will be beneficial for society. She did not believe in revolution. She did not believe against going against the religious establishment. Rather, she believed that the religious establishment needed to be educated, something which King Abdullah incidentally did a few years ago. For those of you who remember, he sent 4,000 clerics to re-education camps so that they learn about religion. People forget these things, but I don't. <laughs> well, I could listen for the rest of the evening, but uh, we we'll, we'll want to leave a little time for you to sign books. My pleasure. Thank you so, so much for Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.